Hello, we are now on lesson 10 of section 2, which corresponds to the magnetic field. We'll explore the magnetic field generated by moving charges and electric currents. Initially, we'll see Ampere's and Laplace's laws and a problem resolution. Later, we'll focus on Ampere's law, Ampere's theorem, and Biot Savart's law. Let's begin with the initial part magnetic field produced by point charges. Ampere and Laplace derived an expression that determines the magnetic field at a point P, created by a point charge moving with velocity V. In the expression, mu sub zero is the magnetic permeability in a vacuum, equal to 4 pi times 10 to the power of minus 7 newtons divided by ampere squared. Q is the charge in coulombs, V the velocity vector in meters per second, and R represents the position vector in meters. This vector connects the charge Q, which generates the field, to the point where we are calculating it. Lastly, the scalar R represents the distance in meters between the charge and the point P. Let's solve an example. Consider a positive point charge with a value of 1.6 times 10 to the power of minus 19 coulombs moving at a speed of 10 to the power of minus 4 meters per second along the z-axis. We need to determine the field at point P with coordinates x equal to 1 and z equal to 1 when the charge is positioned at the origin of coordinates. To proceed, we need to consider the expression we've reviewed earlier and begin by calculating the position vector. This vector links the charge to point P, where we aim to determine the field. Given the charge is positioned at the origin, the position vector in this scenario shares the same coordinates as point P, which are x1 and z1. Hence, we can express it as the sum of unit vectors i and k. Its magnitude equals the square root of the sum of the squared components, resulting in the square root of 2. Next, we will calculate this vector product between the velocity vector and the position vector. First, we'll calculate its magnitude and then its direction and sense. We know that the magnitude of this vector product equals the product of their magnitudes times the sine of the angle they form. What is the sine of the angle they form? If we refer to the graph, we observe that the directions of V and R create a right triangle, where the sine of alpha represents the side opposite the angle, with a length of 1, divided by the hypotenuse, with a length equal to the magnitude of R. Substituting, we realize that the magnitudes of R cancel out, leaving the magnitude of the vector product equal to the magnitude of the velocity, which is 10 to the power of minus 4 meters per second. Next, we are going to calculate the direction and the sense. The product of vectors v and r must be perpendicular to the plane defined by these vectors. Considering v and r lie in the xz plane, the resulting vector will align with the y-axis. Our remaining task is to determine whether the sense will be positive or negative. To determine this, we use the right-hand rule. By aligning the four fingers of the right hand from v to r, the thumb points in the sense of the positive y-axis. Hence, the magnetic field equals a magnitude multiplied by the unit vector j. To calculate this magnitude, I substitute the values of mu sub zero, q, v, and r into the expression, resulting in a final value of 0 0.56 times 10 to the power of minus 30 teslas. Let's move on to the second part, magnetic field created by electric currents. We have on the screen a closed loop circuit through which a current I is flowing. When observing a differential current element, um, I'm DL, the magnetic field it generates at point P is analogous to the field created by a point charge at the same location. This expression defines the magnetic field produced by a point charge. By substituting the charge Q with the current element I, differential of L, I obtain the expression for the differential magnetic field generated by this current element at point P. To calculate the magnetic field created by the whole circuit, I would have to add up the contributions of the infinite current elements that make up the circuit. This infinite summation leads us to the concept of an integral present in Ampere's law. This law provides us with the magnetic field generated by a continuous current within a closed filiform circuit. However, calculating the magnetic field of filiform circuits doesn't always require integration. It is possible to apply Ampere's theorem, which tells us that the circulation of the magnetic field along a closed path is equal to mu sub zero multiplied by the current passing through any surface bounded by the given curve. 
Let's see an example. Let's examine an infinitely long straight conducting wire situated along the z-axis with a current of 1 ampere passing through it. We will compute the magnetic field at point P with coordinates x and z equal to 1. The process involves establishing the direction and sense of B, mapping the magnetic field lines, and utilizing Ampere's theorem on them to determine and clarify the magnitude of the magnetic field. The first step is to determine the direction and sense of the magnetic field. In this expression, we see that the direction and sense is marked by this vector product between the differential of L and the position vector. The differential vector of L carries the direction and sense of the current, that is, the positive sense of the z-axis. Hence, I can represent it as its magnitude multiplied by the unit vector k. The position vector carries the direction of u sub r, which can be seen marked in blue on the screen. By applying the right-hand rule to perform the vector product between these two vectors, I determine that the resultant vector aligns with the positive direction of the y-axis. Hence, I can express the differential magnetic field as its magnitude multiplied by the unit vector j. The overall magnetic field produced by the entire wire would possess a magnitude and unit vector j aligning in the same direction and sense. Next, we move on to step 2, determining the magnetic field lines. Upon examining a current element, this one, and visualizing the field it generates at point P, Using the right-hand rule, we observe that the magnetic field at this point is parallel to the xy plane and the direction marked by the arrow. If we shift point P along the concentric circumference with the wire, the magnetic field's magnitude would remain constant, unchanging. However, the direction of the magnetic field would alter, consistently tangent to the curve. Hence, this represents one of the field lines. These field lines manifest as circles residing within planes perpendicular to the z-axis and centered on the mentioned axis. As it appears on the screen. Finally, we'll determine the magnitude of the magnetic field by applying Ampere's theorem. What this tells us is that the circulation of the magnetic field along a closed path is equal to mu sub zero times the current that goes through any surface bounded by that curve. The curve in question is going to be the field line that we have just determined. It is going to be this concentric circumference with the wire. Initially, let's calculate the circulation. Inside the integral, we can notice a scalar product between two vectors. Within this circumference, these two vectors are parallel, resulting in the scalar product aligning with the product of their magnitudes. Moreover, I can extract the magnitude of the magnetic field from the integral since the magnetic field remains constant at all these points. Finally, we're left with the integral around the entire circumference of the differential L, equivalent to the length of the circumference, which is 2 pi times r. The Ampere's theorem indicates that this circulation, which has yielded b times 2 pi r, equates to mu sub zero times the current passing through the surface enclosed by that circumference, denoted as i. From there, I can clear that b is mu sub zero divided by two pi. Substituting mu sub zero for its value, I obtain that the field is two times 10 to the minus seven teslas. That's all, thank you for your attention.